And welcome to another <coughs> edition of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today in the Think Tech studios is Think Tech's own Carol Mon Lee, uh, Chief Operating Officer. And uh, Carol graciously agreed to join me here on very short notice. And it's going to be a, a bit of a different show today. Uh, Likeable Science, we usually keep it very upbeat. Uh, we usually have scientists on. Carol would be the first to admit she's not a scientist. Right. Uh, we're going to talk about a subject, too, that, that, that's sort of emo emotionally laden for us and uh, for both of us. Uh, we both uh, have lost companion animals in the, in the recent past, and we thought we would do a, a show on companion animals and why people get them, how they get them, some, some of the aspects of, of owning, if you can be said to own an animal as much as they own you. So, uh, Carol, why don't you give us a little bit of background on Mickey, particularly? Thank you. Thank you, Ethan, and thank you for having me on this special show. And first of all, my condolences to you and your wife on the loss of your parrot yesterday. I know it's thank very you. difficult. Um, yeah, I was the lucky, as you say, owner, I don't know who owned whom, of uh, Minky. We called her Minky Mon Lee because that's my middle and my last name. And Minky was actually the mascot for ThinkTech for the last two years. And there's a picture of Minky. Uh, she was a Maltese, and I got her at the age of 12 from um, a friend of mine who was a hospice nurse. And one of the patients that this my friend uh, was giving care to passed away. And when she passed away, she asked my friend Kayoko to take care of her dog after she passed away. So Minky was 12, and uh, Kayoko and I decided to kind of co-parent Minky. So Minky spent most of her time with me, but um, also uh, Minky stayed in the life of uh, my friend Kayoko, so it worked out really well. And uh, so I had her for two wonderful years, and during that time, um, I have to tell you, I had never owned a dog before. Uh, as a child, I had cats, mm -hmm. and uh, most of my life I didn't have any animals except my late husband had a cat who passed away at the age of 20. So for me to get a dog was a completely new experience. I didn't quite know what to expect, um, but it was an extremely wonderful, important, and uh, life-changing experience in many ways. Dogs, dogs are amazing animals. I mean, they, they are so uh, hooked into people uh, in ways that virtually no other animal it really is. Uh, uh, I've kept a, a wide array of animals over the years, from fish to hamsters to I raised a baby squirrel. I kept large snakes for a while. <laughs> uh, for the last uh, 20 plus years now, I've uh, been had uh, parrots. Um, but dogs, although I've never really owned the dog, I had some as a child with my family, but dogs are have been uh, domesticated so deeply that they are incredibly attuned to people, even when they have never seen people. You can take a puppy, a young puppy, who has never never seen a human being, and if on the first time they see a human being, if the human being looks one direction, the puppy will turn and look that same way. Just no, immediately. I'm kidding. Wolf, wolf pups won't do that. Jackal pups won't do that. Fox pups won't do that. Domestic dog pups will do it very reliably. It is as if they know something within their infantile brains already understands that people are very important to them and they should pay attention to what people pay attention to. And cats don't do no, that. No, cats, cats couldn't care less about what we think in exactly general. Exactly, right. My son has a cat. I visit him all the time. The cat could not care less about me. <laughs> no, cats I feel rejected. Yeah, cats generally care about what, what's good for them. You know, they're very, very uh, self-centered animals in yeah, general. I um, see. But uh, dogs are not. But it's, it's interesting to look back and think about how when, why, and where people started keeping animals because this didn't happen overnight, right? Uh, uh, and the animals we keep as pets today are very different than their wild ancestors of eons ago. And of course, you know, initially people would keep animals, hunt animals, right? And then started keeping some for food and for exactly, milk right. and for mm -hmm. the Raising fur. animals for our life. Right, right. Okay. And at some point, of course, dogs began working with people, they would assist them in hunting, they were served as good sentinels, since dogs have very acute hearing and all they, people soon discovered, of course, dogs would wake up and rouse a, a camp right. before the people knew the trouble was on its way. Cats, of course, early on people discovered cats were very good about keeping uh, rodent populations down and, and that meant they had more food for themselves. So one can sort of understand how both, the, both cats and dogs got deeply intertwined with, with humans. How about how long ago are we talking? Uh, I think the, the genetics are now showing that dogs have been domesticated for something 
in the order of 10,000 years, roughly. 10, and years. it looks like maybe they got domesticated a couple of different times in a couple of different places. Um, and oh, that's, that's still a matter of some debate, I guess, among, among those who study that sort of thing. And what about cats? Cats, it's a little less clear. I don't think the genetics have been done quite so well. I, it's pretty clear that happened somewhere, I think, in northern Africa, that cats were first. Right. Uh, and of course, the evolution of the animal from the large cats, tigers, and lions to well, no, those are cats or dogs. Well, well, well they are big cats, right? Those the cats, the house right? cats were descended presumably from some relatively small cats. Still, exactly. well, it wasn't wasn't like a tiger shrunk. <laughs> but um, but gradually, uh, you know, over time, people began keeping animals for no for no apparent reason. That is, it wasn't working for them. It wasn't. Uh, you know, uh, helping them actively in life. They, they were just... But for food. Right, they were right. just pets, more or less. Companions. Yeah, companionship. Right. Yeah. And indeed, that, that aspect of companionship is perhaps the driving force in today's, at least, much of today's world, right? For well, do, you, do you find, though, for instance, um, China, mm -hmm. uh, when, it, over the years, more recently now, you find people who have pets and enjoy mm -hmm. animals, dogs, uh, as pets, but for many, many years, and maybe it was because of the economic situation, mm -hmm. where food, um, uh, the cost of food, the cost of day-to-day -day living did not allow families to have that extra money to pay for food, mm -hmm. although, of course, dogs can eat scraps right. from the table. So, have you, are there many cultures where dogs are not that role? No, I've actually wondered that, and I've not made any study of it, but, but I've often wondered that there probably are cultural differences of more pet keeping in some cultures and less in others, and certain animals, dogs, which are, I gather, eaten for food in, in some cultures, probably yes, they are. might not A be lot kept of the as Asian cultures. Yeah, might not be kept as pets so frequently they are. Uh, one, one would suspect that those two uses for a dog might be sort of uh, sequestered from one another, right? <laughs> um, but the, 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 one of the things that pets offer us in terms of companionship, it, it, the companionship is of a different nature than people, right? And, and you, you must know this from Minky, right? Uh, Minky trusted you, would, would never criticize you, say, <laughs> you look awful today, Carol. <laughs> well, the only, uh, of course, way, method of communication, well, there are many nonverbal right. methods of communication, but her verbal self, of course, was to occasionally bark. And I... Uh, tried as much as I could to try to interpret her, her, her barking, but I, I couldn't always mm -hmm. understand it. But I read something recently. It was very helpful to me. It was, always talk to your animals, talk to your dog, because mm -hmm. even though you may think that the dog is not understanding you, it, it's the sound of your voice, mm -hmm. the comfort of the voice, and certainly the tone of your voice that they can glean what, you know, in general, uh, you're talking about, and they somehow seem to know. So um, I could differentiate a difference in the type of bark mm -hmm. from B Minky, whether she was upset or purring, helping, uh, uh, you know, uh, or tired mm -hmm. or something, but I could never quite understand. Mm -hmm. Now, did your parrot talk? Yes, Ar Ari knew a few phrases. Uh, it wasn't one of her real strengths, but she, she would say her name. She would tell you that she was a good bird. She could, you could uh, understand right, her right. saying her name. Right. Yeah. So she would, and yeah, she, would, she would say, say Ari, 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 very clearly, and would say she was a good bird. Sometimes she would say she was a pretty bird. Uh, very occasionally, she, she would say she was a pretty good bird, <laughs> <laughs> which we thought was very amusing. Uh, and did you teach her those she, words? Uh, she sort of seemed to know more of them at, at the start, and then, then words uh, that she heard a lot, she would gradually pick up on. And so you said you had Ari for how many years? We had Ari for almost 20 years, yeah. And she was how old when you got her? She was probably around three years old when we got her. Um, so already verbal. Right, right, yeah. They, they of course, are verbalizing fairly, fairly quickly with parent to, to chick and all, so, uh, but... Uh, is that what you call a baby parrot, is a chick? That's what we call any baby bird, I think, but... Oh. Uh, uh, I don't know, there's probably a technical term for it. <laughs> Well, the ornithologists probably would criticize me here, but um, but the whole emotional thing you were talking about about, about that you could look at the, the, a bit of the posture, the way that the ears go on a dog is is, is the way the tail goes, right? Those are all telling you cues right. as to how the dog is feeling, and, and the birds would be the same the same way. They'll they would adopt certain postures, and fluff themselves up uh, when they're comfortable and relaxed. Uh, 
They'd sort of puff up and sit quietly. If they got scared, they sleep down. Uh, you saw in those pictures of, of Ari there, her yellow crest. When the crest goes up, it, it's a sign of excitement. Now that could be. Could it show a picture of Ari? It, so it, it could be excitement. It can be happy excitement so, there. So the yellow. Right. Um, the, the yellow crest feathers. They're, they're crest mobile. Crest feathers. Right. Ah. And there's another picture or so where, where the crest feathers are. Uh, yeah. There she is. Her crest feather is you know, are down basically. Ah, I see. Yeah, she's riding her skateboard. So this was the other thing, of course, about these birds is they're incredibly smart. So she rode a skateboard. She played the piano. She, she and Pico played basketball together. Um, did you she, train them to do that? Or? We, we, we did. Uh, my, my wife, Thea, did much of, much of the training. Uh, I trained some. Uh, I used to train fish, actually, for some years of my life. So I, I understood that you can train animals to do things. Training fish? Yes, yes. So tell me about that, because training fish seems a lot harder than training <laughs> a bird or a dog. It, it is. Uh, the fish were not... They were in a tank. Yes, right. I, I was training the fish to uh, approach a target that was lit up. And was we, this for a scientific? Right, and we were trying to, to look at, at aspects of their visual system. And so if they could see this particular color of light, they would, they would approach the light and they'd get a brine shrimp reward. And then we could make that light a little bit dimmer. And we kept giving them a choice until they were just choosing randomly. And then you knew they weren't really seeing the light anymore. Ah. And then you'd turn the light a little bit brighter and, and suddenly they'd shift back and, and be choosing all the right stuff again. And what kind of fish were these? These were an African cichlid called Haplochromus bertoni. Um, small fish maybe that long. So these fish were really more for scientific experiments rather than for pets. Right, right. They, yes. Although the people do keep the, the cichlids as, uh, as you know, aquarium fish too. Yeah, they're, they're, they're very nice and quite pretty. They've got some interesting behaviors. Um, they're a little, a little too aggressive to keep with too many other fish, but um, they're, they were, they're fine and interesting, interesting fish. Um, and then that gets sort of into the next thing I wanted to explore is there are these different kinds. People do keep fish as pets, right? People keep yes. rabbits as pets, mice as pets. Some people keep spiders as pets, right? Um, snakes. Snakes, yes. I, I you kept snakes for many years. I, I think of those as, as sort of uh, low investment pets in some sense. Typically those pets, not always, but typically they don't require as much care uh, from their owner. Um, you can buy it with, with a little more just routine, hey, it's got food, it's got water, it's cage, isn't dirty, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and the animal is perfectly happy, basically. Um, dogs, cats, and the parrots, you have to do a good deal more than just sort of basically letting them be and seeing they have food and water, right? You have to... Right, yeah. but you also get a lot more in return. Exactly. I, I don't see much return for a snake. Right. I, I had one of my boas for 20 years. A and, boa? Yes. And, well, the snake, I was quite convinced it actually knew me as an individual and actually sort of liked me because she would come preferentially sit on me rather than other people. I'd, I'd pass her around a group of people and she'd always end up back on me and settle down on me and would then move from person to person to person until she got back to me and that would stop. Was your boa the type that constricts? Well, all, all the well, boas constrict. constrict. Yes. And were you ever afraid that it was going to harm no, no. you? No, no. She, she was. She had no reason to go after me. Uh, How about any other human? No, no. They're, they're. None of the constrictors would attack people. People were really too big for them to eat. Oh, I see. They might attack defensively if, oh. if they felt badly but threatened. Small animals. Right. Are right. Um, yeah. Small animals were, were quite at risk from them. <laughs> 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 uh, to put it mildly, yes. Um, <laughs> Anyhow, there, it just seems to me there is a whole uh, a continuum, right, from very sort of low investment animals. The snakes, again, I could leave my, my boas for two weeks at a time, literally, and not... At home? Yeah, at home. Would you leave them in a cage? Yeah, yeah, they would be in a cage. There was a bowl of water. They had, typically I had a heating pad there for them to sit on if they wanted to get a little bit warmer. So did and you have the boas the same time you had your, your birds? No, no, th those did not overlap. No, because um, uh, one would not survive, probably. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. They, 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 those two. Some some animals just don't really go together well. Right. Um, but now the the parrots are at that opposite end of the continuum. Very high maintenance. Very emotionally attuned. If we were to leave for uh, 24 hours, we had to have somebody come in, sit with the birds, and really? somebody, and we would give them a, a six or seven page list of here's all the routines, here's how to get them up, because they're very devoted to their routines. They get very upset if you break their routines. Did they fly around your house without? We, we, we kept the, the wing feathers clipped so I didn't because flying is a very dangerous thing. Oh. But we're going to have to take a break before we continue this conversation. Okay.
And we'll be right back. Carol Mon Lee, CEO of uh, Thick Tech here, and I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Likeable Science. Aloha, my name is Joe Kent, and I'm the Vice President of Research at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. The Grassroot Institute is a public policy think tank, and we try to build a better economy in Hawaii, and you can see us on the TV show E Hana Kako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcasting Network every Monday at 2 o'clock. We'll see you there, and let's build a better Hawaii together. Aloha. Aloha, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pauline shuckmak -Jen. I'm the host for a new show on Think Tech Hawaii called Outside In. Outside In will be taking a look at how the external world can help shape Hawaii's future. And I will be starting the show hopefully next year in terms of regularly scheduled programming. And we hope to invite a wide variety of different guests ranging from history, philosophy, art and architectural fields, all the way to robotics, biotech, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and the like. So we're going to have a full range of guests to cover many different areas of interest. And I hope to see you next year. Until then, aloha. And you're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. With me today is Carol Mon Lee, Think Tech's COO. And we're talking about pets or animal companions, as many people like to call them. And I think it's a better, a better description, really, in many ways. People typically get these animals for companionship. And uh, that the, the, the doesn't imply quite the inequity that the, the pet ownership implies, right? right. Um, but as people go into this business of getting pets, in, and we, I've seen this time and time again with parrots, people see a parrot or see somebody who has a parrot and think, oh, how wonderful this is. These are these colorful, bright, intelligent, active animals. Oh, I must get one. And they rush off and they buy a parrot, not realizing what incredible amount of care these animals take, how emotionally in tune with you they are, how uh, delicate they are, how loud they can be. Uh, and then they decide after a few weeks or a few months they don't want it, and they hand it off to somebody else who maybe wants it, and these parrots get passed around and mm. to owners who don't understand them, and the bird doesn't understand why its home is now changed abruptly, and it does, doesn't work out well. So, so there are questions I think that people should consider when they're thinking about a pet. Sure. If you're getting a pet for a six-year-old, it's a rather different thing than if you're getting a pet for a 12-year-old, right? The six-year-old has right. much less capability of, of doing some of the, the basic pet care. And, right. and to some extent, it seems to me it depends on what you want to get out of a pet. So sure. I, you, well, I'll give you my own right. personal yeah, story. So As I said, I had never had a dog, mm -hmm. and uh, my husband passed away about five years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, after he passed away, several friends um, said, you know, you should get a dog, because I live by myself. And uh, my son's on the mainland, and he has a cat. And he, he wanted me to get a cat. Mm -hmm. And having had cats, and my husband and I had a cat, I decided, no, I really wasn't interested in the cat. And um, I was looking at dog pictures and dog books, and friends would bring over their dogs. There's Minky again mm -hmm. on the screen. <laughs> and. Um, I'm going to the, oh, there's another picture of Minky <laughs> with her rabbit ears in time for Easter for everybody, saying hi to everybody. But um, uh, I actually made a list on my phone of the attributes I wanted in a dog. Oh. I wanted it to be small uh -huh. and a female because I heard that a female dog is less aggressive. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to be older because I really didn't want to train it, not having had the experience training and not wanting to go through that learning curve both for the dog and for me. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanted it to be hypoallergenic because I am allergic uh -huh. to dogs. Uh, and I wanted it to be white because a friend of mine had a beautiful white Bichon Frise and I just thought, I did such a nice little dog. And I wanted it, as I said, small so mm -hmm. I could manage mm -hmm. it. So I had this list on my phone and I went to a friend's house, this um, nurse, this uh, hospice nurse who happened to have four dogs that she was caring for. And one was Mickey, huh. the Maltese, who huh. actually fit every single wow. one of my wow. items in my checklist. Yeah, that's and uh, she was 12, so mm -hmm. again, very mature. Mm -hmm. And she lived for another two years. Mm -hmm. 
So I got Minky for companionship, and she worked out beautifully. And for me, uh, one of the many things that I enjoyed about her is that I was able to bring her to the studio all the time. Uh, yeah, yeah, and so we welcome. have pictures of uh, Minky yeah. with Jay, Jay Fidel, and she had been on a, there's mm -hmm. Minky and mm -hmm. me and Jay. Mm -hmm. And the Jay, as you probably know, is a great dog lover. Uh -huh. He has Emily, his uh -huh. dog is Emily. And there's Minky mm -hmm. with Jay on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I recall you would you would show up with Minky in, in basically a, a large handbag. Yes, huh? I would take Minky everywhere. Yeah. But uh, she did uh, provide wonderful companionship mm -hmm. for me all the time. And as you say, part of the attributes is that because she wasn't judging me, mm -hmm. and um, I wasn't judging her particularly, mm -hmm. <laughs> except for when she had right. mistakes or accidents. But she was a, a wonderful companion and. Uh, opened up a whole new world for me. And now what I find is, even though Mickey's been gone for many months now, um, when I go on uh, uh, the internet, I seem to gravitate toward pictures of dogs and other animals and <laughs> funny pictures and stupid pictures and, you know, warm stories about sure. animals. And it's just opened up <laughs> this whole new uh, slice of uh, I was going to say humanity, but I guess it's more than humanity. <laughs> right, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> For me. But you don't, you don't think you'll get another dog at this point? You know, that's a you know that's the common question. Yes, I would like to get another dog, and I have been looking, and mm -hmm. friends have been suggesting different animals, and I go to the Humane Society once in a while to mm -hmm. look, and uh, I. Any, anybody walking in the market who has an animal, strangers, mm -hmm. I will usually say hello to their mm -hmm. dogs. <laughs> so I'm in. I'm looking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm hoping the right one shows up like my last one showed, right, showed right. up. Right, right. How about you? Are you going to get another parrot to accompany well, your second we're, parrot? We're, we're in transition. And it's really, really right. I think, it's too, too new. Yeah, too, too, too yeah. early to say what's, what's going to happen here exactly. But yeah. um, there, there is this uh, issue, and you, you alluded to it earlier, about having the resources for a pet, the time, the energy. Uh, you know, with a dog, clearly, if, if you're working two jobs or three jobs, you may not have time for to, to give the dog to give the attention it needs. Maybe you could get by with a cat, particularly if you, right. but, um, and again, these, these birds are even more demanding than dogs or cats in terms of their interactions with you. They, they really, they're used to being in, in flocks of dozens to hundreds to thousands of their own kind and want to be interacting with, with others all, the, all well, the time. Well, I know you had two, two birds, right. so were they interacting with each other? Only very minimally. They actually didn't particularly like one another. They, they had been brought into the, our home at different times. Uh, we brought in the second one thinking the first one was bonding a little bit inappropriately to Thea, wanting to spend too much time with Thea regarding her as a mate. And so we thought, let's get another bird. Purposely got a smaller bird, a female bird, uh, so we wouldn't have any of the aggressive interactions. But they never particularly hit it off. We sometimes jokingly would say it's because the first day that Ari met her, she jumped down off the couch and jumped right on top of Pika. And they may have not have ever liked each other since then. Oh, <laughs> but, um, because you would have hoped that they could socialize with uh, each other they, they when you were both working Right, they could groom each other, and that's what we had hoped these two would. would but that's about as close as they would ever get. <laughs> and, you can even and that's see Ari on the right? It's Ari, Ari down below. Oh, Ari on the left. And, and you can see Pika sort of is, is actually see. giving her, keeping a close eye on her, because that's, that's very close for Ari to be to her. And, and Pika was a little bit scared of Ari, because Ari, although she doesn't look at there, was about half again as big as Pika in terms of her so, weight. So at home, were they flying in a cage, or are they flying free? They each had their own cage. We would have the cages open when, when we're home uh, at all times. Whenever we would leave, we'd be sure the birds were in their cages and the doors were were secured because you don't want them wandering around. Right. Uh, peak attendance to stay on her cage. Ari, we actually had to put a little barrier at the foot of it so that she wouldn't get down on the floor because otherwise she'd then wander around the house and could get into all kinds of trouble. We, for years, we actually had her gave her free roam, you know, free reign of the house yeah, in yeah. Seattle, and she would run around and and uh, that, that was all. It, Worked out well until one day we had a house guest of mine over, and this guy who weighed probably 250 pounds took a step backwards and stepped right onto her tail. Oh. And it was just, we realized like uh, another inch could have just been just devastating. So we gave that up. Right. <laughs> and now, why did you get uh, birds? For companionship or for 
my wife Thea had actually worked in a jungle gardens in Sarasota, Florida, doing a master of ceremonies job for a, a bird show. She had birds trained to ride bicycles on the high wire and play cards with audience members and uh, ride balls and, and do all kinds of little tricks. And she had a whole line of patter that went with this. And so she knew all about these birds, knew they were uh, interesting. Had um, a friend in Chicago then whose daughter had this, this bird, uh, Ari, and the daughter got ill, was ho hospitalized, and the bird needed a temporary home. Um, and so we agreed that we would foster parent this bird for a few weeks, maybe a month. Uh, the daughter did not get better. Uh, we ended up some months later, the daughter still in the hospital. We were leaving C uh, Chicago for Seattle. We brought Ari with us, and uh, she was with us then for many years, and moved out to Hawaii with us, uh, laid one egg here in Hawaii. But she was a remarkable bird. She was uh, uh, smart, intrepid, uh, very good-natured. A lot uh, of personality. Yeah, yeah, a lot of personality. And uh, just just a, a truly amazing, amazing animal, leaving sort of this huge, huge gaping hole in our lives um, yes. after all yeah. the, the years. Yeah. Um, yeah. But... Uh, well, pets, um, I mean, companionship is really a very uh, broad term because, as we know, particularly dogs are used for so many reasons for... Um, emotional support and for uh, help mm -hmm. with dis disabilities and handicap uh, and uh, so many other reasons and actually other pets mm -hmm. can serve that purpose too yeah, right yeah, exactly exactly pets pets can help us on a lot of levels there's a lot of evidence that pets are good for people in hospitals they lift the spirits of people in senior living situations etc I think we're gonna have to wrap things up here is that that's what I'm hearing but it, this has been very enjoyable and enlightening, as, as I always want my guests to be. So thank you very much, Carol. I, I've enjoyed having you here on Likeable Science. And I hope uh, you'll come back next week and, and join us for an, another episode here on Think Tech Hawaii. Until then, aloha. <laughs>